coming. I know some of you come quite a distance uh, this evening, Brixham, Plymouth, and all the other uh, Cornish ports, um, to hear Aaron Brown Fan Fan Fishing Queen um, and his presentation. Um, the page here, believe it or not, is Brexit, should be Brexit for the fishing industry. Um, and we need a policy that works for everyone, not just a few. And that's part of it. So, um, over to Aaron. And uh, yeah, any questions? Um, sure. Yeah. 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 Well, evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you very much to Derry to organise it, because I know from uh, experience of doing this myself, it's not easy, especially the fishermen, to get a meeting together as a herring and cats in some ways. So well done, David, for that. Um, so yeah, as she said, I'm from Fishing for Leave. Um, some of you will remember our name from the referendum campaign, and some of you will remember us from this, the tent demonstration. I might add, going through this, bear with us if it cuts off or we have some problems because of the wire connection here with the temperamental there with the flight show. So yeah, we did the Thames demonstration. We enjoyed our day out when we were enlightened by Mr. Geldof. So all the, as to how great the CFP has been for the UK fishing industry. It's just as well he was there to tell us what we didn't know already. So yeah, that's what we did. And we really, for the first time in many years, were the only group, or were the only group that spoke up for the fishing industry during the referendum. Amazingly, certain interests and certain other organisations chose to remain deadly silent. And really, what you saw that day epitomised the attitude of the metropolitan elite in London to the fishing industry. They thought and had the temerity to send a multi-millionaire out to shout down fishermen who are really struggling under the CFP and tell them that they were actually well off. And that's part of the reason we feel we've got to keep going so the fishing which they do have to stay for, isn't sacrificed a second time. We have a wonderful, fantastic opportunity that I don't even think many in the industry realise the scale of it to revitalise and rebuild UK fishing. But we are going to have to struggle against not only vested political interests, but vested interests with our own industry as well. We just want to see a continuation of the status quo. That is not good enough for the whole industry. That is not good enough for Brexit as a whole, and we have got to absolutely fight to make sure that our voices are heard and the opportunities realised. So, Fishing for Leave, well, it's a grassroots industry organisation. It's founded to highlight the potential of British fisheries and really to ensure, through getting out of the EU, that the opportunity and a bright future for our industry is realised. As our purpose remains, we've not to use poor English as leave until we've left. We are resolved and absolutely determined to go on to make sure that Brexit means Brexit. So today I want to highlight to you not only the devastation that the EU has caused to our industry, many of you know already, but we'll say for the benefit of anybody from the public or the news cameras, but also the huge opportunity we've got to regain our industry and the resources that under international law are rightfully ours that were sacrificed to join. Sacrificed as expendable by Edward Heath and his rush to join the European Union. That has caused untold devastation and heartbreak all around the communities, fishing communities in the United Kingdom. So, on TV. Our, that picture, this picture says it all. That is what the political class in this country think of our industry. That is what has happened to us. Our industry has been decimated by the EU, absolutely. It's tens of thousands of jobs and billions, hundreds of billions of pounds have been lost to the UK economy as a whole. We've had millions of tons of fish discarded every year. I think it's a million tons a year, is it, were discarded? Is a figure around about that? I think we've guesstimated that. It's probably more. I know I discard half of what I capture every week quite easily. So all that caused by EU quota rules that are unsuited to the UK's mixed fishery. And no matter what they do going into the future, they are effectively trying to find a square peg in a round hole. So we've had environmental destruction on a colossal scale, social destruction on a colossal, colossal scale, and economic destruction on a colossal scale. And now, 
is a coup de gras. We're going to have a discard ban that addresses the symptoms of the quota regime not being fit for purpose rather than address the cause. And all it will see is a continual or the acceleration of the consolidation of the fleet into fewer and fewer hands as the majority of boats will not have enough quota to survive. Even guys from my direction, I can't speak about the southwest, but I'll hold me up what are called the Big 12, <coughs> top quota holders in Scotland. And there is not one of them where I pose it to them. I say, have you got enough fish to be able to account for every tail you discard just now? And the answer every time is no, they're not. So how anybody expects to square the circle that in one hand we're going to have a regime that says you can only keep so much, but the other hand, another set of rules that say you don't keep everything. I wait to see all the <coughs> ideas that have been advocated so far are nothing more than tinkering around rearranging the deck chairs as the Titanic sinks beneath us. We have got to go to a different regime and fishing for leave advocates at ease at sea policy, which we'll come to later. So, first of all, really what we've got to speak about to understand is a twofold thing. One is how do we get out of the European Union? And the second thing is what the hell do we do after it? So, firstly, <coughs> we've got to understand what there's a community that have been dead said there was Crown's Bay, that's Aberdeen, gone, Air, gone. I'm sure we can keep list, listing port after port after port as we finish. So, what is the UK EEZ? Well, under international law, your EEZ is your exclusive economic zone. Everything therein belongs to the nation. That line in the map is actually the true border of Britain. Everybody on the line, even maybe some within the fishing, think that Britain's border is the beach. It's not. Under international law, it's that red line. All resources, living and mineral, within that belong to the nation under international law. Norway protects theirs, Iceland protects theirs for a moment, not for a moment, would the Norwegians and Icelandic suggest that they'd open their territory up to a free-for-all. If you turned around to the public and said that the French were going to own 70% of the farmland in Britain and then we were going to shoot half the sheep that we raised, outrage. <coughs> but that's what's happening in the fishing industry just now. It's swept under the carpet and it's our job to highlight that and hold the government's feet to the coals to make sure that we move to something that stops it. So that there on the map is probably one of the finest pieces of aquatic real estate in the world. Now currently just now, if you just have a quick scan through the figures, Norway lands two, two million, I think it works out as, tons of fish every year. Britain lands 600,000. 70% <coughs> of the allocation of resources within our EEZ is the EU hands. Now we take that back, and it's the right to do so, which we'll explain to you in a minute, and that means Britain, or the United Kingdom, can't be an equal fishing nation to Norway. We take all our resources back, as can happen unless fishing sold out a second time, we will be an equal fishing nation to Norway and could be the ninth largest in the world. That's the potential of Brexit there. I'll come to a minute for stocks that are in this area. And when you see just for four species in the south coast of the Celtic Sea, what we get far, you'll be astounded. Add that up around Britain, and it's about 1.6 billion pounds worth of fish that's going out the door for free every year in the whole of the French and Spanish industry. You multiply that up to process value, it's around 4.6 billion. And when you put in an economic multiplier, as big as that can be, we've had some preliminary discussions with various different people on all that. They estimated that that extends to between 10 to 15 billion for the wider economy as a whole. It's colossal what has been lost. And if you think for a minute, if that works out at 10 billion of fish every year for 40 years of EU membership, that's 400 billion, it's a third of the national debt that has gone out the door in fish resources alone. So, that's our EEZ. As everybody knows, I don't need to explain this to you guys because you're all pretty battle hardened. We all look pretty battle hardened. That's all the different sea areas that ICES, the international scientific body, divides the sea up into. When you add the areas, all these different areas together, Britain has about 60% of the grounds in the North Sea. We've got 80% in the West Coast. And down here in the South, country, in the, the South Coast, Celtic Sea, 
we've got about 45 to 50 percent in the water. However, there's no Somalia in North Korea. Yeah. Well, the, the line comes down, down along what, 12 miles, it just happens to coincide at uh, the back end of Mull, and then turns into where the border is at um, London Derry, or Derry, depending on your political persuasion, and then it comes back out here at the top bay and turns the way down the other sheet. So, we have a huge scale to see, but of the overall quota that's set right over, we only get 23% of the North Sea, 48% of the West Coast, 24% in the Irish Sea, and down here in the South Country, well, it's just about a national disgrace, 12%. That's how much we've been skinned for. So, how did we get skinned, effectively, robbed? of our own resources under international law. Now this is the critical thing, is to actually understand this. Because to understand how to get yourself out of a mess, you've got to understand how you get into it in the first place. So, what happened was, and it actually goes back before the EU as many people think, recently just now a worrying development has actually happened, and that is that in London, in Whitehall and Westminster, the media and others are being briefed, a narrative has been set in train that actually, even if we withdraw from the EU, we've still got to give all these continentals access to our waters because there's a thing called the 1961 <coughs> London Convention. Now, it conservative part of the conference, which three of us attended to keep lobbying on behalf of the industry, a fishing MP, who should know better, comes from a fishing background, I won't say names, absolutely was adamant that this convention meant that there had to be continued EU access. Now, she gave two things away in that statement, which is quite funny, because they continually keep telling her, oh, we don't know what we're doing yet with Brexit, and we're not really sure what path to go down. And yet here was a 50-year-old convention that had been forgotten about, buying down the table adamantly, that this meant we had to keep giving continued access. So, they've been scrambling a bit harder than they make out. And the second thing also is, why are they desperate to find a 50-year-old convention to continue? EU access to our waters, and the only conclusion we could withdraw was speaking to all the other ministers and secretaries of state, but they all gave away a little oopsie each time, was that the UK government is not going to stand on the EU's toes of fishing. So, we had the 1964 convention, which effectively was an agreement between <coughs> seven major coastal states in Europe to allow access to one another's waters, within the 6 to 12 mile limit, because that's all existed at the time. And, it says, for vessels of the contractor, for the, for the, for the <laughs> vessels of which fish in the waters between 1953 and 1963, well, I am pretty sure there is not many boats left in the European registry that are 50 years old. It's only for between 6 and 12, and it says in the convention that any of the parties that are subscribed to it can terminate the agreement with two years' notice. The British government can easily repeal that convention right now and when we get our waters back off the EU and withdrawal, we'll be back to a clean slate. Now, the importance of the convention is also that they're digging desperately to find a way to allow the EU to keep fishing our waters <coughs> to understand their toes, but also that in some ways was the first sweetener to the European <coughs> Union the EEC to allow Britain to join. Now, we all think we joined the European Union in 1973, However, not many people remember, in 1961, Mr. de Gaulle knocked it back. He said, Britain didn't belong in Europe. He was actually quite right. But listen to the French for once. We'd actually be better off at the end of it. So miraculously, after Britain, with the British political class desperate to join the EECC, remarkably, two years later, here's this fisheries convention appears to say, come on, lads, in you come. Come and, come and fish round right about our coastline. Now, so that's the start of the slippery slope. Then what we had in 1970, before Britain joined, was the establishment of the CFP under Regulation 2141, 1970. And what that did was establish a common fisheries policy for the Union, for the, the European community. The bit where the British fishing industry became expendable was in 1972, 1973, when we joined. And it is um, Article 100, or Section 100, of a recession treaty. One little paragraph that basically says that we are quite happy to hand over our fisheries to European control and we accept everything that has been laid out as a common fisheries policy in that regulation in 1970. <coughs> then in 
Thereafter, what we get is a 10 year period. The European fleet built up a track record of working in our waters. And thereafter, there was a it saying? It's not a happy tale, is it? Uh -huh. no. That's why Norway didn't draw, join at the time. Their ministers understood and valued their fishing and didn't turn around with Keith when he was asked, what about the fishing? He turned and said, how many fishermen are on there? And the minister replied, 40,000 or something like that, 100,000 people depending on it, so it doesn't matter electro. That's where the experiment comes from. So, we agreed to CFP. For 10 years, we run along, allowing a race track around Britain, all these foreign boats towing our waters, and then miraculously, 10 years after the built up track record, we get Regulation 117 1983, which established a quota regime and relative stability share outs. And this is really what we've been struggling with ever since. That awarded 70% of all resources in UK waters to the EU fleet because, as we all know, they fiddled the paperwork. The French designed the system, planned the system, because they wanted a fishing fleet at our expense in our rich waters. And they knew when it was coming, and they probably went along and added a zero on to the end of every figure that they'd actually got. And that is how here, in the West Country, we only have 12% of the quota in our waters. So, those are the founding tenets of the CFP. Everything thereafter are just branches onto that initial trunk. Now, there's two things in European law. There are regulations, which you can speak of, and directives. Regulations allow the EU to impose law direct onto Britain. Does not have to go through, does go through our Parliament, effectively goes through the portal of the 19 of our accession treaty, the European Communities Act, straight in. Everything we have in the fishing has come straight from Brussels, straight to us, right? Directives, on the other hand, are things that are effectively advice from the European Commission, go and implement this, and the British government goes off and does it makes up its own acts and legislation, bills and acts to do so. So, fishing's been an exclusive competency from the start of Europe. That's why they built in regulations, because it took over at first. So there's direct EU law that the fishing industry operates under. But this is a critical thing for Brexit and for the industry. Since you've got that initial tree trunk, a session, uh, the regulation for the CFP, session treaty agreement to and the regulation set up quota is relative stability and all the other regulations that stem from it. When you cut the trunk of the tree, it falls over. How do we cut the trunk of the tree? Well, a misunderstood or overlooked thing, because everybody bans the name about it, but I don't think they understand it's Article 50, and specifically Article 50, Section 3. And the key words are, the treaties will cease to apply. Now those words, are the key to getting all our fisheries back. Because if the treaty ceases to apply, then all EU laws is a clean slate where we can implement our own fit for purpose policy that's inclusive of all the industry to rebuild what's been devastated for all the coastal communities around about. Now that, that's a key thing. All this all we've got to negotiate, hogwash we've got to negotiate. There's nothing to negotiate. We leave CFP ceases to apply and under. We go back, effectively you wind the clock back to 1973. That there, which is our exclusive economic zone under international law, is what we have. And what we want to do with that therein, under the terms of one clause three, is up to us. Now, the worrying thing is, is the government keeps saying negotiate, negotiate. Well, as I've said, there's nothing to negotiate. And it's worrying that certain people in the industry are picking this up as well. What they're trying to do is so a narrative that we have got to start from where we're at just now and then fight and wade through treacle to get out. That narrative has been sown to try and start us from where we're at, to keep us where we're at, for political convenience and with some vested interest in the industry who don't want to rock the boat and can't see the bigger picture. But 
by starting afresh, and great futures inclusive of them, not to their detriment. Sorry, sir, you're standing on your hand. Is it true that country, EU countries that don't have tax, direct access to the sea still have rights for fishing quotas? Yes. The barter yeah. off for other. How fair is that? It's not particularly fair at all. <laughs> Mental, actually, the fact. Oh, you pull what you've got instead of like Norway, like Iceland, where you've got a nation and an industry who have a vested interest, a stakeholder interest in it, like all managing it well, you're effectively putting fishing out to just being a pawn on a big political chessboard to be bartered and negotiated with. And, that, and, that, and that's why the CFP is such a disaster area. Hello? Can I start? Well, you know, probably if we would, well, you, you speak about um, when Article 50 is triggered, yep. and then it's a clean playing field. Has it, please correct me if I'm wrong, which I may well be, um, has it already been decided that um, the Great Reform Bill would actually enshrine all the EU law into British law yep. and then it would be unravelled slowly? Yep. I'm of the opinion that because of the low amount of, um, of the low amount of contribution of the fishing industry to the GDP, <coughs> we will be the last people to be consulted. Yeah. Uh, but the EU law will not, the EU law regards to fishing, will not make the insight because the EU law will be enshrined in British law. Absolutely, and that's what I'm coming to. That is the next word in development. This is a positive thing of what should happen. Clean slate, back to 1973, will be two years to devise our own fit for purpose policy that works to rebuild the industry, end with all the problems we've got just now that we've been effectively forced into between all the sectoral infighting of under 10, over 10, PO, non-PO, co-holders, non-co-holders, on it goes. We've effectively been reduced to be put like rats in a sinking barrel left to fight amongst ourselves. And the sad thing that sickens me is the two greatest dangers to the industry now. One, what you've mentioned, which I'll come to, and two, the industry itself. There's too many men within this industry are that blinded by their own self-interest that they can't see the bigger picture of what's actually there before them. It's the kind of attitude of, it's all right in the prison, you get three square meals a day, but we don't want to go inside into the big bad world. Of it. It's ludicrous, but sadly there are people that are actually like that. Most of us in the room will know who they are. One of them has been phoning around the part of the said, telling people that the great remainder of, of Newland, telling uh, people that they need to cancel. But th there's been somebody from within one of the federations who were in the English up in London telling ministers, just keep it as it is. Can, it's deplorable. It really actually is. And so, as you mentioned, the Great Repeal Act, we wrote into the Fishing News, published articles in the national media about it. What the government now proposes, was we thought great, Article 50, we trigger that, runs its course, clean slate, Bob's your uncle, brilliant, get a fit review. Well, at the Tory party conference, our hearts hit the floor. Because everybody, even the Brexiteers, were brilliant, great repeal act, sounds brilliant, repeal, super, <coughs> start the Brexit process. Nobody let, read the second line, which Phil's pointed out there, which says we will adopt all EU law, or we will adopt the acqui communitaire. Nobody knows what that means, it's a French word for the body of EU law, the acquisition of the community. So everybody breezed over it. What the government is now proposing to do is to adopt every single EU rule, regulation on the UK statute book. Effectively, we'll be stuck exactly where we're at just now. Now, that then comes to the excuses to say, ah, well, it's okay, we'll, we'll be fine because what we'll do is repeal it. Well, fishing isn't high on the agenda. From what we can ascertain in their attitude, they're desperately looking for a way to keep European boats fishing our waters, so we would be digging up 50 year old conventions and banging them to the table before us. And, on top of that, where's the political will going to do? come to do this. You've got a Remain voting parliament that even just now are all going to try and overturn Brexit. Are they really, once we leave, going to start tearing through all the regulations on behalf of a small industry with the fishing? Well, anybody that thinks that has happened or is going to happen is living in cloud cuckoo land because it absolutely is not. It isn't. They're going to keep fishing just as it is and we'll say to the Europeans, you know what, we won't stand on your toes over fishing. You keep all what you've got. We don't really particularly care. And that's what the industry's got to guard against. And if there's those within the industry who are going up to London just now and saying, status quo, please, are the ones that are listened to, then the industry is stuffed. And that's simply what it is, because we'll adopt equal access onto 
the UK statute book will have adopted relative stability quotas onto the UK statute book and will have adopted a discard ban onto the UK statute book. And a discard ban is going to, as I've said, be the final nail in the coffin for the UK industry. We have got to move away from the, the, the current system of events because otherwise we'll be stuck in a pincer movement between the environmentals and the discard ban causing a consolidation of the quota onto fewer and fewer boats and nobody has enough to survive. And then on the other hand, on the politics of it, where the French and Spaniards will be jumping up and down and have legal grounds if we adopt the CFP to fight in human rights legislation because they'll be able to turn around and say, you can't deny us what was rightfully ours, so we still want our slice of the pie. And the industry will have absolutely blown both feet off for short-term interest. So that is a great, great threat now to this industry that just to reverse the phrase will have snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Well, have come within a whisker, a whisker of having all that which we've never dreamed of and we'll let it all go. And then we'll be stuck in a system that they say repealed the legislation when Ireland left the British Empire in 1922. It took them 40 <coughs> years to repeal every UK law. And that's when the rule book was about that thick as some of the older people in the, in the room will remember. And that was with a country and a newfound republic that detested Britain to its core at the time. They were feverishly ripping them up and it took 40 years. There's hundreds of thousands of EU regulations and the government's trying to kid on them and get to tear them all up once we, once we leave. Well, whose leg are they pulling? What they're trying to do is fudge Brexit. Yes, we'll have control. Yes, Parliament will be sovereign. But we'll match every EU law point for point for point. And in the case of the fishing industry, the next reform of the CFP, every 10 year reform, it comes up in 2022. We'll start doing the groundwork of the 2020, 2019. So what's the bet if the government doesn't just turn around and say, look, we're actually really busy with the big matters of state. What we'll do, since it's a joint North Sea, a joint English Channel, is we'll just mirror what you're doing with your reform CFP, and that's the industry stuck in that for 10 years. Now, the greatest problem within this industry, and I point this out to ministers, is we have a demographic problem. There's not enough men in this industry because things have been that bad for that long. And there's not been a future. And men should have followed on in their fathers and grandfathers' footsteps were told. You know, I was told the hell away clear from fishing. It solved the blood bit a little bit too hard. But by the time they get around in 10 years to maybe thinking about, let's do something with the fishing, we'll go around, what's the fishing what was dead? That, that's what you come up against. So even if there is maybe political will somewhere lurking in a closet, deep down in death run to do something positive for the fishing industry. By the time they get round to it, there'll be nothing there left to say. And with the discard ban, all you'll have is mad international water dancing to say the big 12 and whoever down here that thinks they're big coal holders, they'll get stuffed as well. Because a couple of big companies will just buy, 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 consolidate the whole industry. And that comes back to what everybody's known all along. The government wants a centrally controlled couple of big company industry that's easy to run. And that will totally squander the opportunity to, to rejuvenate, not only not even to rejuvenate, but it'll be a final nail in the coffin of all these places that are higher on to survive. And it'll never come back. Once it's lost, what young men are going to go, you know what, instead of doing a 40 grand a year office job sitting, make tic tac dinosaurs, I want to go into the North Atlantic and roll myself out inside out. There's not, there's not going to be a rush of young men to come back into the industry. Once the family heritage of all you guys is gone and packed up, that's it. I mean, I'm Peter Head. There's no, basically no family pair teams left. And all your skippers that are there just now, David knows some of them, what are they, 45, 50, 55? Yeah. yeah. This will come down to cost. When you speak to, when you speak to government and you speak to, I don't you to speak to, A big part of the government's mind is they actually understand a lot of what we're saying, Aaron, but it comes down to cost for them. Yeah, you know, the industry costs a lot of money to run. Yeah. It's because basically you run it in a really bad way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's too many people trying to run it. Yeah. And the, the industry really has to put forward ideas of how to cover that cost. Yeah. You know, if you if you look at countries of similar sort of size, similar sort of fishery potential, somewhere like New Zealand, um, when you when you look at New Zealand how they run it, the, the quota holders pay 
for the cost of the running of the industry. Now, the industry has to answer. You know, if, we, if we want a great future, if we want a great future, we also have to take on the burden of the cost. Well, definitely. And it does. It becomes in politics. But then you, then you, you start know. answering the questions of the politics. Well, I'll answer them then. So, and really, as you say, it comes down to someone's only uh, okay. Someone's only got, uh, you can only sell what someone's prepared to buy. Basically, comes down to, we'll come to that in a minute, as you say, our government. Because it has become a, a nightmare for them, and that's why they want a simplification of it. So, we get this huge amount of fishing that grows back, we get full control back, and the opportunities within our grass. So, then we've got to decide what to do next, which we'll come to in a minute. But, however, first, for you guys in the West Country, I'd like to show you just exactly what has come up and the opportunity for it. It's all right, David, we're just killing time for you. <laughs> So, if we get any outside for a cigarette, any else to choose to understand. Right, what we've got here. So, we've covered a bit of how we get out. Article 50 is a clean slate. The fishing industry now must unite to oppose this great repeal bill. We must stop or get an exemption for fisheries being rolled over, the CFP being rolled over into UK law. Because if that fishing goes through as part of the Queen's speech that is getting adopted in May, then we adopt the whole CFP, lock, stock and barrel. And if anybody in this industry can honestly stand up and write up to fishing news and say that fishing will be high up in priority and listen to the field of the man. Can I take questions in the end? Because otherwise we're going to lose this and get disjointed. Right, so what we come to next is what we get back and what we actually, and how we manage it. And I'll touch on David's point. Fishing for Leave is commissioned and built a database that allows us to see exactly what has been caught where in all European North Atlantic waters. Now, this then comes back to the part of within your UK, EEZ, within your EEZ, all resources belong to you. The fish is in our waters, it belongs to us. Simple fact, no argument. That's the law, right? Despite what the remainder say, fish having no passports and no borders. If I had it goes back and forward 50 times between the Norwegian sector and between the UK sector, it changes its passport 50 times in a day as well. That's the way it runs. So, what is actually moving on? We touched on the quota thing earlier on. Currently, Monk, Area 7, UK, 21% of the allocation, right? Of that, the EU has caught 19% of the TEC <coughs> UK waters. So when you account for what we caught in theirs, which isn't actually terribly much, then you end up with the post-Brexit the allocation among them should be 40%. So that is doubling the quota, right? It says the cod, I don't know why, I should say the species. The tonnage repatriate works out at 6,858 tonnes, which is worth 22 million pounds on the prices. All these figures just for a comparison from 2014, by the way, so it's like for like here, comparing oranges with oranges instead of apples with oranges. But then move on to Seoul, 7 Eastern Channel. Now, as we saw, we basically get 50 50 in the channel, but we only get 13% of the Seoul allocation. The EU catches 37% of the TEC in our waters. So that means post Brexit, we should be looking at somewhere on 49%. I've actually deliberately picked species here that we catch very little of in their waters. I think they catch 1.6 billion in our waters, and we catch about 100 million in theirs. It's even deafer in the during the referendum. <coughs> and I deliberately picked species this, and it's actually the majority of them, just to make the figures simpler. So, 37% the UK should be 50. That's 2,000 tons of sole comes back to Britain, worth 17 million or 17 and a half million annually. 70E, which is the doorstep out here, I believe. Um, 57, 43. Somebody in Cornwall was doing their paperwork well, and the new quotas were coming in. It seems to be the only stop in the whole southwest that we actually seem to get any decent share of. So one of you or somebody that you know is fiddling the paperwork to try and do their part for, for Britain when the numbers are getting tallied up. But yet again, even though you think we actually got a good allocation on the EU, still catch more in our waters than what we get. Again, there's um, what we'll put the wrong one on. Oh, well, actually, that'll the right one was the funnel. So 82 tons come back, 700,000, every little helps. Sole, F to G, 
up the Bristol Channel. Well, no surprise there, just now that the UK gets um, 24.76, 25% caught by the EU, big chunk comes back again. And so the story goes on and on and on. So what we end up with here is showing that the current, just in these four species this is for, by the way, this is just the four examples. This isn't all the others which tally up. Currently, in the South Country, between Bricks and Plymouth, Those four species that we looked at there would give us 18, 14, 1, and 56 million. We actually get 63 million back. It's colossal. And when you add this up, the figures is huge. Massive. So, because of what would be brought. And there's some people in the industry said to keep the status quo. Well, those people should be flying to the street by the members. So, 112% increase in the value, 55% increase in the tonnage, and that adds up to 120 million for the Cornish and Devon economy every year in four species. There we go, down in the south country, keep it looking nice for you. So the next thing, what do we do and how do we manage it? Just now the system's horrendous, it doesn't work economically, it doesn't work environmentally, and as David touched on, it doesn't work administratively either. It is a total headbanger of a system where they have put one sticky plaster after the other to try and cover up a gunshot wound. It's because the system that we work under, the quota regime of the Mersal Mixed Fisheries, does not fit the ecology that it's applied to. That's a fundamental flaw, and no amount of regulatory tinkering is ever going to change that fact. We can have rollovers of species, which to me is crazy, because if you're just going to roll one and quota into another species, what's the point of having a quota in one species? Or well, having rollovers, well, that's just kicking the can down the street for the problem for the next year. There's no way we're going to have a discard ban, but we are going to have a discard ban, because it is not politically expedient for the government to drop it. George Eustace went outside and said, we are going to drop the discard ban. The environmental groups would rip him to pieces alive in the street. So the industry needs to get its head through its head. A discard ban is going to happen. So we, as an industry, have got to come up with an alternative to address the cause of the problem, which is the quotas, and not address the symptom, which is just a ban. So where does the problem come from? And the, start, the problem comes that we are trying to treat a mixed fishery as individual species. We're trying to treat it like a bar graph where all the species effectively float along. This is where the problem of MSY comes in. We're trying to jack maximum amounts of everything. Well, it's impossible in an interdependent ecology. So you've got all these individual bars, if you like, that make up different species that support the overall ecosystem, right? So the problem then becomes is that because we have quotas, we have less discarding, we have less reporting, the data that the administration of scientists get back is dodgy, they don't know where to start from. So the allocations don't then fit what's actually going on in the sea. And by the way, if you could make the allocations fit with what's going on in the sea, what the hell's having a point having a quota in the first place? And therefore, as we take out all these individual different blocks of fish, it destabilizes the whole ecosystem, it causes excess pressure and fishing effort because you're having to catch more to land less and dumping tons and tons of prime fish over the side because of the more moral abortion. And it causes the nightmare of regulation as they try and bring in more and more regulations to make something to buy a square peg into a round hole. What happens when we bring the discard ban in? Cash quotas that were trialed, as I said to the people that initially instigated them, you think they were so damn clever for playing the system that you couldn't realise it was a system that was playing you. 
Brussels six cash quarters is the best time to get sliced bread. It's their ultimate way to consolidate the fleet onto a few boats. Because again, there, nobody has, but a very few, enough quota to sit underneath it. So we bring the discard van in. Some people in the industry, up my direction anyway, still don't actually have a ready paperwork that says when you take your smallest species, your lowest <coughs> level of quota, you must stop fishing, because otherwise you can go to sea and catch what you're not allowed to keep. So as fishing effort goes up, we hit, we'll just chose Megrum here as an example, we hit Megrum, the whole fleet has to stop, and that's the British industry absolutely knackered. We won't address the cause of the problem, we merely address the symptoms and blow both our feet off at the same time. So, what fishing for leave advocates is going to a day to sea system that one, which what the transit metamorphosizes co entitlement into days of sea. And the reason we've got to do that is because people have been forced to spend a lot of money on it. People have been forced to put millions, a couple of million out just to survive. There's one skipper in the North East said to him, we don't want to buy quota. We don't like buying quota. It's just what we've had to do to keep going. And we have. So what we advocate is we move to days of sea, we change, ultimately it's FQAs that people have bought, not the actual quota. We change FQAs from being expressed in kilograms to being expressed in effort then nobody loses their track record, their bank doesn't pull the plug on them because they see their investment being jeopardised, and you get a way to move on to a more ecologically fit for purpose policy where you can keep what you catch and where the scientists are getting the right data back to estimate and to work out what the stock levels are. What we also think should happen is, fair enough, people have paid for resources. All the UK allocations just now should be respected because that's what people have paid good money into. However, what we advocate is there should be a resources amnesty. Keep what you've got already, but this huge level of repatriating resources goes back into a government pool. The industry has been forced into a situation that was probably deliberately designed to decommission itself as you had that consolidation. As the smaller guy couldn't survive, so he sold, he sold to the medium sized guy. The medium sized guy didn't have enough to keep going, sold out to the large guy, so on, so on, so on. So, People should keep what they've got and pay good money for it, but all the extra comes back should be held in the government pool and distributed across the whole industry for the benefit of the whole industry to build it back up. At the end of the day, fishing is the people's resource. It belongs to the nation, and we should end this corporatized situation which is destroying fishing communities, fishing heritage, and it's not good for big or small alike. The small is pushed out and big are bleeding through the nose to try and keep going with Bancoa. It's just a downward spiral into the abyss of the last man standing. So, what do we advocate? You've got to build your policy, move to the NC, because you've got to build it on sound ecological principles. And what we have here is a Pharaoh pyramid system. And there's no pun intended with Pharaoh and pyramid. And this is what the Pharaohese based their system on when they scorned the international order sandwiched between the EU, Norway, and Iceland and said in 1996, Quotas don't work in our next fishery, but we're going to a days and sea regime. And everybody decried that we can't do that, and it will be terrible, and the sky will fall in, and they did it, and it works. Okay. Why? Not the first time. Not first time. Go ahead. So, what they base their theory on is that you've got to treat the ecology as a whole, right? It's picked as a pyramid shape for a particular reason. Illustrative purposes, it doesn't mean it's an action of the ecosystem of total pyramid. But as we all know, all the stocks are independent, interdependent with one another and each stock has its sizes, its size range across it. So what the Fairway say and some Icelandic scientists advocate is what we've got to do is instead of trying to take out individual blocks of species misguidedly with the poor data that's feeding back, you need to take an even slice across all species and across the whole ecosystem. You don't try and pull individual belts out, you try and take a skim off the side. So what you can effectively see is the red lines represent effort. That's your toe, if you like, along the seabed. You take a bit of prawns, a bit of sole, a bit of meg, cod, white, whatever, all down the sizes. And what then happens, as the boats fish away, is you reduce the whole ecosystem evenly. You effectively you reduce it, you shrink it down, and effectively what happens is the ecosystem allowed to breathe like a set of lungs. Expand, contract, expand, contract. And what you've got represented here is the arrows going in the way is the effort, how much you reduce the stock down by, and the arrows coming out the way are your recruitment, how much the stock can build up within the year. For a sustainable fishery, what you're trying to do is balance those two things together. 
That's effectively your principal MS. Why the problem is MS is why they're trying to address individual stocks rather than look at the health of the ecosystem as a whole. As a Norwegian scientist famously said one time, he says, it doesn't matter what you want to do with fish. He says, the North Sea holds a million tons of marine life. He says, it doesn't matter if it's a million tons of hay, a million tons of corn, or whatever combination you want to put it, it can only take a million tons. You can't just keep blowing stocks up to a scientifically dreamt up level that you think should exist. So, he balances both the effort, expands and contracts, <coughs> excuse me, and what you then get is a balanced ecosystem. Well, how to manage this? This comes back to days at sea. It's what you're effectively wanting to balance <coughs> is effort against the recruitment. What the stock brings in against what you take out. And overall, what you're trying to do is balance that evenly on top of the whole ecosystem so you don't destabilize it. So, why we advocate going today is easy to administer, better scientific reporting, better economically because you can catch less but land more. You're keeping what you catch, so as we say, the data feeds back better. And what then thereafter should happen is treating the ecosystem as a whole, you turn around as a fair reason, you say, right, we think we start with a million tons in sea, say for the North Sea, and we've got so much power that can catch so much fish, so we believe we can extract X amount. So you say to the boats, right, off you go. Technical measures as well to, to preserve certain things. You can have real time closures to push people away from stuff until you get a balance. What you're effectively trying to do with that real time data is create a speed stop. So you balance that effort against the recruitment and you balance the effort. Because fishing on the North Sea can be cast, there's incentive at the time when to do so. You have also incentive to report it accurately because instead of the current system that's now where you're incentivized to cheat and misreport, you're actually being incentivized to declare everything. Your percentage, you lose days at sea, so you've incentive not to target a particular species. You still get your track record based on what you've done before, and if you stay <coughs> well below it, you get some extra days for behaving yourself and not being naughty, right? Therefore, you've got a system that allows you to keep what you catch. If you exceed it, you get reined in by days. But if you do go above it, people say, oh, I'll lose my days. Well, so what? You've got your trip in. If I go out and take it down here, I think you've got a big problem with haddock, is it? Haddock everywhere. If you go out and you hit a patch of haddock, okay, you come in with 100% haddock, you lose five days at sea. What do you need the five days at sea for? You've got to <coughs> go and play golf, go and see the kids just now, or go non stop, time and time and time and time, to an up and down and put extra effort in the stocks, extra effort in ourselves, reduce our profitability to find these little bits we're allowed to catch. So, Therefore, when you bring in these percentages, that allows people to keep a track record. Nobody loses out. You spent a million pounds in cod or a million pounds in haddock. You've still got that entitlement. The FQAs don't disappear. They're still there. The bank can't complain. And what it does is it gives the managers the fine tune ability to say, well, we want to discourage people from cod, we want to discourage people from sole or haddock or whatever, right? And you allow that to be your fine trimming of certain species, right? So you've therefore got a system that works with the ecosystem. It's simpler to administer because you've just got technical measures of data to see. There's none of this chase about this report and the electronic law because the list cameras, the list goes on and on and on. And if anybody thinks they're not going to put on cameras for a discard button, well, you better go down and see your doctor. 
because none of this would be thought would have satellite monitoring, none of this would be thought would have electronic logs and buy down and drop them now. They will put cameras and goats in force, 100% guaranteed. Okay, they might not watch all the footage, but it's a deterrent factor that it's there and they could do. So, we've come up with a system that allows simpler administration, keep what you catch, better scientific reporting, um, an ability for managers to have fine tuning stocks, a way to keep track record, and a way to balance effort with recruitment. So, really what it comes down to, that's two things. How we get out, and what we do once we're out, okay? We cannot end up keeping the current system. It might seem a truism, but fishing is not just a job, it is a way of life. It's our heritage for all of us here. I love this industry, but I have made a colossal sacrifice to do fishing for me from the time. The money I've spent out of my own personal pocket to get this going, the amount of abuse I've had, the amount of people in the industry that have stabbed it in the back to try and stop fishing for me is incredible. And some of you will know who they are and what they're up to. Fishing is the epitome of our emissions in the EU. And the result and the result of fishing will be the acid testing Brexit. We intend to get fishing for leave nationwide to every port, to every harbour, and to create so much pressure on the government that the fishing is as big an issue as free movement in the public to show them what's happening to their industry, to show them how much we are wrong though, to show them how young families are having to leave their local communities because they can't keep going, but young men should be able to go to the sea and come home and provide for, for their wife and their young kids. Okay? We are the industry that should be the epitome of what the government wants to self reliance and community base and all that crap that they can and to read the name of the It can be the acid test of Brexit. They evidently do not have the courage to stand up to the EU and in Nigel's words say, We're very sorry. We know you've had a fantastic time catching 70% of our fish, but like Iceland, like Norway, like Faroe, who stood up to the might of the Royal Navy and the British Empire, mm -hmm. we're going to tuck our tail between our legs and cower away. That's what I think the government's intent in doing. And they don't have to. Fishing could be a beacon of Brexit. <coughs> Are the Germans going to choke on a deal with Britain? Bosch, BMW, Siemens, Volkswagen, the list goes on and on because of some French and Spanish fishermen that cheated the books years ago. No, they're not. The phone call will go from Berlin to Paris to say the game's up, tough shit, sit down, be quiet. Okay? But we have got to make, got to make fishing that asset test. We've got to make it that issue that's as big as free movement. This is our resource. That's our wars. That's part of the country. And it's a huge benefit to all the communities. But we all need to come behind and work to do it. This is the one and only chance. I know within the industry, lots of people's heads went down and everybody thought, well, that's it, it's a fair complete, it's a one way track, that's us finished, and, and the heads went down. But this is a chance. Between now and May, when this Queen's, um, Queen's speech comes out, to adopt all EU law and keep us locked in the CFP, talking in perpetuity, that is our chance to make Newland, to make Brixham, Plymouth, Lowestoft, Aberdeen, Peterhead, Fraserville, Lerwick, and all the other towns that are really like a war memorial that have been decimated to get back on their feet and really go again. But we need your help to do it. For political convenience and short-term interests within this industry, we cannot replicate the CFP into British law. Even those who think they're big coal holders, even those who think they've got all the cars and don't want to see the, the debt reshuffle, will get crushed by the discard ban. So a second betrayal of the British fishing industry, a nation, a, a nation of the people's greatest natural resource, is our greatest natural resource, cannot be betrayed, cannot be squandered, because that is not acceptable, that is not Brexit. That is why we at Fishing for Leave are resolved and determined to fight on a great personal cost to ourselves to ensure the industry and the tens of thousands in it, and who could be back in it, have a brighter future. To make sure that we play our part and get our country back, and this golden opportunity isn't squandered. It really is time for us to be like our ancestors and to flourish great and free. Thank you very much. Scotland independent. 
Well, if she declares to be independent, and this is the incredible thing, and she keeps saying, we want to stay in Europe. Excuse me, is that good? No. Exactly. I'm getting a bit dry. Anyway, she says we want to stay in Europe. Well, there's no possibility for her to stay in Europe. Either she's as stupid as she looks, or she just wants <laughs> listening. Because, because, because generally, in 2014, they were specifically told by Barroso, the European Commissioner, by Herman von Rompuy, the, the, the Council President, the list went on and said, if you become a new nation, you've got to reapply, and you've got to take the euro, you've got to take the full aqua, you don't get any of the exemptions that people have built up. So they've got to come out. Now this is the interesting point of fishing, and the people, or some of them that start fishing, are going to go back up north with this going to be Scotland, this and run from Edinburgh. Well, all right, that's great, you go back the SNP up, because when you leave and you come back in, you're evidently naive as to how the EU works. Relative stability keys mean that everybody gets a share. We've already got a crap share in Scotland. Well, when you come back in, we're going to take that already poor share and divide it back up again between everybody. So they're going to take what little share you've got and divide it out to the 60% to France and 30% to Denmark. So the fishing would be absolutely stunned. And in the end, it's incredible that a party that apparently backed national control, backed Scottish fishermen, is now just doing the polar opposite. It, it really is. Will she get independence up home? I don't think she will. I have that. But, but, if they did, Scotland goes its own way, well, back into Europe, well, the industry slaughtered up north. But down here, as the UK, you have a huge but one, of the, opportunity to one of the things is, when, uh, when you do go, or if Scotland goes back into Europe, that is us out of the North Sea. It is over the, the northern half of it. Yeah. It would be. That's right. But and that bothers me, because the greatest share of the uh, fishing in lots of ways is the North Sea. Well, it is. But then when you look at that, when you add up, as I say, what's lost in the, the, the West Country? The Celtic Sea, the English Channel. I fully it's agree with it comes back. I if, fully agree with you. If it does happen, it happens. It's not, it's not within my control, fishing for leaves, or even indeed in some ways the British government. It will, it will depend how they handle it, whether they give them a referendum or not. But if it happens, it would be a great tragedy. Personally, being on the ground, I don't think it will, but that's something we need to. I hope so. We didn't, we didn't think we were going to go out of Europe, but we brought it. So now we're going to focus on not squandering the chance. That's presented that's right, as a key point for yeah. And if we do well, I hope the people that cause it to happen really do rule the mistake when they look at their own door as well. Mm -hmm. Looking at this map. Sorry, was this, I was going for this, Jeff. I'll come to you in a second. Yeah, uh, flight convenience vessels. Well, the fact the chamber we're in will become null and void when we leave yes. the EU. Uh, are your figures including the, the landings from like, convenience vessels, no. like Spanish and no. Dutch? No, so even more, but there's no way to determine, really, unless you went right back into every log book and trawled through it, which you could do, but we don't have the resort. Don't have there's resources. one big Dutch freezer trawl that's got 25% of the UK and that's the metal problem. That. So when you take the flagships out, it's actually even more those figures. I mean, those figures are incredible, it is just through the policy of equal access, let alone when you take account of the flagships, and they do go. But again, in some ways, that comes down to resolve the British government. You would revert back. Obviously, back to obtain was a big case where effectively the Lords recognising that the rulings from the European Court of Justice realised that Parliament wasn't supreme in the merchant shipping act wasn't. European Court of Justice goes, you go back to the, the, the merchant shipping act, you can throw them out of a problem if the results there do it. However, if you and the whole Hacky community are all EU law, you're still in the European Court of Justice, you're still with the um, you're still with those rulings. You're still with the um, flagships and all the things that are there. Effectively, all they're doing with the dog team, the, uh, the CFP is nearly both for our feet to the floor. Anyway, uh, there's a kind of mention comment that uh, looking at this map, you know, uh, the Solway Firth is a median line, and the out from the coast of Northumberland and uh, the Scottish border, I mean, it's a pity, it's more than half the territory what Scotland's got. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge so, you know, I mean, she'd be, uh, to say, oh, well, we want to give all that to Europe. I mean, she'd, she'd be on a sticky wicket on a referendum campaign anyway. Oh, so. a sticky wicket anyway. 
But yeah. then, but then yeah. again, that, that, that comes back again to somebody's watch here as the industry speaking up. For too long, <coughs> for too long basically it's happened in the industry. And I'll say this honestly, people in the room don't like it, that's tough shit. What's happened in the industry is we're kicked into a position where a small clique of the party nationwide decided last man standing, I'm going to be the last, and it was a case of last rat and sinking barrel. Okay? And that mentality seems to be be, be great institutionalised and stuck with. So it comes down to really the industry's got to say it's speed up. No, we're not having that. But the end, the SFF and the NFL will just talk to the wall and say, no, we don't want to do too much. We want to start from, start from the status quo, not make it up. That's what you're up against, and that's what the industry, the majority of the industry, the decent guys in the industry have got to unite and fight for. Because you're now you've effectively caught people in the industry running the whole show so the other thousands who are getting screwed over. And it's just not acceptable. That's the truth of the situation. People might not like it, but that's the fact. Okay? Anyway, next. We're doing all this work to, um, to, you know, to, to leave Europe and look at our own fisheries uh, and, and, you know, fighting for you know, the for, you know, for it. But who's actually going to police this? Well, the interesting thing is this is a question I get asked all the time. And it's the thing you see people say before it's how we police it. So we've got a man in tight in Norway just now. And we've also got one in the Now, under the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission, there is an agreement that all the different coastal states need to share with them data, okay? EU shares of Norway, Norway shares of the EU, fail, blah, blah, blah. They all, the best are all interlinked. The Norwegians can set and access the same DMS system that our fisheries department can as well. And by going to do access, if I go into Norwegian waters, they know I'm there before I know I'm going. Okay? They're that good to get all your long group reports from straight to Berger, straight back to Edinburgh, vice versa. So with the electronic surveillance you've got today, the fisheries office isn't today chasing French and Spanish boats about with the Royal Navy, which we don't have anymore. Yeah, so I've, done, I've done 30 years in the Royal Navy, yeah. it's left literally last month, yeah. so that's why I'm asking the question. You, you can send one to VMS, you see them coming to your water, you send a boat, as long as you catch them fishing, you do the same as Norwegians do. And Norwegians go into Bergen, they point the gun at you, I mean, Scots fishing boats have been shelled by the Norwegians in the past, one of them bullets through his death case and Ghent, and one of the lads, by like actual shells, one of the lads went away and stood at the other side of the galley case, and his hands were breaking around the system. What are you doing standing on the other side of the galley case? I'm shelving from the shelves. He says, the shelves are fucking boring the galley case. They're fucking boring on the room. But no, in, in all seriousness, that's how you, you do it. The only way for the EU to get round that is to say we're not sharing any of our enforcement <coughs> information with you. And for the EU to turn around after 10, 15 years of standing on its high horse, preaching to the world about illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing, and then effectively say we're going to let our fleet pillage everybody else is water pirate fishing, it's, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, there will be French and Spaniards who try to just do the same as Norwegians. Into Bergen, 50 grand to get your boat back. And once that deterrence, they're, they're aware of that deterrence there, then... The condition of access, the condition of access, the UK is showing every country to their extent. Eventually, because if you want to run a, a quoted currency system, actually, what, what you suggest, I, I agree with that. <coughs> I agree with a very good presentation. Um, then you need transparency to run that yeah. through for the science system because yeah. we need to move from a proportionate approach yeah. to a flexibility, yeah, definitely. which is what we're trying to achieve. But then the great thing is, and got if, if, if the UK says to, if the UK says condition of access is a long-term aim to monitoring the account. Do you mean a condition of access for our own boats? Yeah. Or no, do you mean a condition of access for the condition of access for everybody? <laughs> right. That's European ban. Everyone. <coughs> as soon as you mention the cameras, it, it, it does two things. It gives them something else to think about other than fighting for the quotas. Yeah. So it, it, it makes them worry yeah. about something they really don't want to do. Because that's what they do now. Certainly it's Spanish and the Irish. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you, you then gain control of the monitoring. Yeah. And you only need 10% coverage. And then the 10% coverage you can have. You only, you only actually have to cover 10% of that culture. Yeah, because it's, it's a tariff in yeah. itself. So, so it becomes self policing Yeah, it does. And that's, 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 where, and that's where a day to sea system is good in itself. Is even without the cameras to monitor it, and you could have the cameras because you wouldn't have any segment too cheap to buy. And then if you're working on a system that's keeping the cash in the box, you'd have to hide there. If you're working in a transparent, decent, flexible framework, yeah. The problem is it's now the current system. The only thing you should think about the one who assessed 
is you have to stop being a royal incentive to erase the footprint. You don't want to create the footprint. The thing is, if you think of the Bible, the idea of the whole house, you create a race the fish. You're not really the fish anymore. I don't want to see this. No, 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 we don't add it. But when you move to a quote of currency system, you're going to be called a currency system. Yeah, it is. Well, because you want to turn quote into a different yeah, yeah, yeah. So it becomes a current, doesn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. how that becomes a current system is that if I had it, you would maybe have to buy two of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it becomes that. So you, you then, that's how you run it. But then you have to have a monitoring system to know that everything that's done we can live yeah. with that. Yeah, you guys can yeah. Exactly. And, and that is something you could borrow to the government for a second and say, look, you can give us a system here that we don't need to cheat and send the presentation. If, if it's a case that you're working under a regime that the more you've landed, the more scientists have the stocks are healthy, and you get more. <coughs> you get the opposite yeah. incentive to what we have now. You do not cheat. If you've not got anything to hide, you don't hide and it creates that relationship. That's another thing that we really want to advocate. We've been across the Norway to speak them over there. Is the system within the region's operating just out of their scientists and fishermen? But they do have a close partnership. It was as much better than Norway 10 years ago as it is here, just out of the scientists and fishermen each other's throats. And the Norwegian government is enough, bind their heads together so they can work through the same framework, and together, on boats together, and off they went. And now they have a good relationship. The scientists know they can trust what the fishermen are saying, they're going to see real time fish and real time data and the fishermen trust the scientists. That's what we've got to get to. This is the thing, the CFP deliberately in some ways has been constructed to create this rats in the thing. Everybody eats each other's throats, continual consolidation, continual lying, continual cheating. And we've got a great chance to move to something different. And if those few big guys in the industry that are sitting going, well, I'm all right, fuck everybody else, get their way, then we're stuck. I mean, one of the fishermen's leaders up at home keeps going on about insisting on barter access to a quota. Now, either he's not fit to be in his post because he doesn't understand how the EU regulations actually work, the relative stability of quotas in the EU construct, or they want to start this narrative that we start from where we're at and we'll tease a bit of quota here and there back through bribing them with access because they want to keep from the status quo, they don't want to upset the cards. And it's a massive betrayal. These men have got to look past what we're in just now to the bright future. And that's what we intend to do. We hope that lots of people can come in behind it. Right, somebody else in the hand up. Yourself. I'd just like to know what your proposals are, especially in this area, for vessels that fish the Irish and the French waters. Well, what the proposal would be is to totally exclude the EU fleet to start with, and then we use the whip arm of how much more resources we've got <coughs> as a barter access on, on a needs must basis, on an equal exchange basis. It should only be, if we get to go into French water say for scallops down here is quite important, you get to come into ours and that's it. It shouldn't be the, the continuation of equal access in all but name, where effectively we are getting really raw in the deal. Again, at that point, we would say they never kind of shot themselves in the foot. They turn around during the referendum and come and say, ah, but we catch 100 million in their waters. I tallied up about 100 million just in a few species in yeah, China. In so what area, we get back... 80% of all the fish caught in this area are going to the EU. But then that's marketing you're talking about. In terms of access for, for fishing in the waters, yeah, we don't need to go to the market. From your market? From your market? Well, why, would, why then, if Iceland... You want all our boats to contract but, back into the trails and they're going to sell nothing? Oh, sure, of all. I have to be back in the trail. Well, the trail's not called trails, but he is Harry Bobby. So it's what they call the trouser meat. Right, okay. So yeah. our fleet can trans back into that. And then where do they sell their fish to? We well, we can trap back in that yeah. amount of resources we get back far out of ways for the leaves. I mean, I'm only asking for a point of view. Okay, well, let me answer. So that trouser leg, there's so much resources that we get back compared to what we have just now. We don't need to go into EU waters. And since we will have the majority of the sea area, we can barter where we need to. The next thing in terms of marketing, if, if, and think of this, if, when you see that map, Norway, Great Britain, Iceland and Faroe basically control the whole of the North East Atlantic. Where else are they going to buy their fish from? Mm -hmm. are they, is the EU Commission going to turn around and say to already desperate people in Italy and Spain who eat fish three or four times a week, mm -hmm. actually, we're going to starve you to shoot the pommies in the food because they threw our boats out? I mean, the, the suggestions were well, preposterous. The British will yeah. well, well, the the well, the British well, they, they might go again at the moment, that's for a while, but there's a whole global market out there. Norway sends seafood globally. UK fish, the pelagic industry is probably the best example. 
in the normal industry, it's actually already gone up this last month, uh, two months ago, you've seen a price rise for the supply of the brand already, just because of the actual demand on, even yeah. when you said, oh, we live in the EU, yeah. it, the, the prices have gone through the roof already. I mean, the thing with politicians, yeah, right, I'm, 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 I'm the questions yeah, yeah. that you're going to get from Fisher and yeah. yeah. actually yeah. 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 So if you end up with, the, in terms of the market, look at really nowhere else to go. At the end of the day, on top of that, World Trade Organization rules that have to revert to in a hard Brexit, meaning you can't employ punitive tariffs even if they wanted to. <coughs> So there's not really any well, any sort of really because like um, well trade organisation tariffs start at ten percent and then rise. They'll start ten percent, see them ten percent. So they can't even impose on that as well if they want. So you're, you're, you're putting in a question and even if they did, right, let's say in the cataclysmic event that they turned around and said, You are not putting one ounce of seafood across the channel. There's a global market out there. I mean in the posture situation that didn't happen. They come off their nose despite their face. I mean, if pelagic conditions is a great example, they ended up with a trade embargo to Russia, where I think it was 50% of the pelagic market was for the UK fleet. And everybody was, oh, hullabaloo, terrible, we're shot off from Russia. Well, they and, and, all and, that. and they went around the world. I just, like, you were talking about increasing your catching capability yeah. with no way to send it. We are importing more. We are eating or importing lots of benefit to be taken for free from our wars. We're buying the French fish back from the French once they've caught it. Because that's the process and the value add, which we don't do in this country. We just send them ashore. We send them over there. Well, that's what we should be doing. We should be coming ashore in UK boats. Your policy of catching fish is. Obviously, got to run in line with marketing yeah. strategy. Yeah. In the market, um, in the market. Can I comment on what, what Mick just was talking about? If we can't sell well, if we kick them out of our waters. I used to fish out of Grimsby, and two cod wars were, took place when I was fishing there. This last one, the first three Icelandic boats that landed back in Grimsby afterwards, I was actually watching them aboard them while they were in Grimsby. It was within weeks of the Cod War ending, they were landing back in Grimsby. It was, there was a brief few weeks stoppage, but within weeks, because bird's eye needed the Cod. And, and you're, you're right, stop. at the end of the day, trade is between individuals and buyers and sellers, not politicians. And at the end of the day, if they start down that road with fish, we well, can say they can do it for everything else. They can turn around and say, well, we can turn around and say, well, you're not going to import BMWs to Britain. They'll turn around and say, well, it's more British. That's what I'm saying. I'm just going to put it You're talking about increasing your catching the market. So there are no loads of fish. We're going to do it. They'll develop their own markets as long as the politics are there to do so. And I don't think anybody else would suggest that the EU is going to go into some massive slog of a trade war that the UK just could have left. It's not, it's not. Yeah, the chances of that happening, of course, it's new that it does happen as a global market. I mean, this is one of the things I would agree with the SFF on. They shrug their shoulders and say, well, we're going to go to the You buy New Zealand land, wouldn't you? Yeah. They're waiting to send the fish to North America and send it to Africa. So what's the small your processor here? We're all the European market going off. Bring around and we'll see where else we go. It's not up to end here. No one can predict the future and say, that buyer here is going to sell to there and there. It's preposterous. So the main thing is, though, sir, and you've got to get it back. You've got to be able to catch it before you can sell it. And we can't keep going down the road where we're letting everything be taken out of our waters for free because we're scared to upset the markets. You've got to catch the stuff first. That's any developing market. Do you want to save with 12% of the South Country? That's fine. I'm always trying to get out of the year before you were born. So. Right, next. Just for the record, uh, it's estimated that two thirds of all the seafood eaten in the EU comes from outside of the EU. Yeah. It's imported yeah. into the EU yeah. from all over the world. That's what's in Norway. Two thirds of it. Yeah, I can buy from the Norway. Sell more. They can't go without it. Are they going to go vegetarian? Yeah. As the gentleman said there, we used to go and catch the fish in there in the Icelandic waters in Norway. They said what we're saying now. I bet that they've all, this is the thing. Everybody said, oh, we do and gluten can't have it. The president said across the board. Iceland and Norway stood up to what then was really the British Empire and Royal Navy. And had a God war with them to sling them out, they managed to do it. The marketing is there, Iceland and Norway sell about the seafood to the EU. 
what we are effectively doing is arriving to the party 40 years too late. And really, that, that, that's what it is. We sacrificed our fishing for some great trade project that's turned out that we're sold apart. And now we've actually got to have the courage to look up and say, you know what, we were a great people one time before, we can't be again, we're going back into the world. And by God, if Iceland, if was 330,000 people in Norway, 5 million can do it, then we can do it too. And we've just, we've just again trapped ourselves, the same as the Federation's this ideological prison of, I've got half a loaf of stale bread, I better hang on to it, okay? Rather than look, there's a whole world outside the prison door, let's go for it. Yes. There is all these nations are thriving and we've got our That's because the EU left me in the fish. Part of that. Yeah. Part of it's that, but also the other thing is as well, it's amazing. It's amazing when the banking crisis came along and we've got a double blow on the as well. But that's what they're doing. Any other? Yes, sir. Um, in your presentation on my closure for it, you said we need help. We need, you need our help. Yeah. There's a small group here. How the hell do we get it out to the rest of the country? Is there going to be another flotilla to Westminster which gets the media? Therefore, the media then get the message out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got a few. We've got a few plans in the pocket this time. Okay. At the end of the day, I've had people phoning me up and saying, "See, they've got direct Brexit. I'll take my boat. We're blocking the bloody Thames. I'm standing over the corner away from here. What the hell? You're keen." <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a lot of us people do lots of that. We've been blocking. Well, so the fishing government. I don't, I don't mean the fishing there. industry. I mean yeah. the government as a whole. I mean, we used to have the support of the British public. Yeah. We used to have. That's all we've got. We used to have. But the British, the British government's media and we're very good at turning around the fishermen and the destroyers and the That's what you need to be because yeah. yeah. you are not the destroyer.
that everybody was efficient together. And sadly, in the last few while, there is that clique within the industry that are just determined that they're going to be the last time to help everybody else. And I understand where that's come from. And I don't decry it, because at the end of the day, this is a bad situation we're put in. It doesn't seem to be any escape, so that's what we had to do. Okay? But now we've got to look at the bigger picture. I will happily work with this. I hope that the Federation see the light and move to something better. I don't think you have to, really to, work. To, think you have to work with them. I think if you take the message I think you've given today, I think that the, 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 the have to shift the other way because the grassroots will drive them that way. So it's it, it's about getting the message. The, grass, the grassroots do not go that way. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, in you, at the beginning of your speech, you said that the borders don't <coughs> at the beaches. They they cover up to the territorial waters. Yeah. So, one of the big factors in the referendum was control over our borders. Now, that's a very simple slogan. And that's, if you can press that, you might <coughs> jump the fishing uh, question up the list. Because uh, it's, uh, it's about them working through these laws and regulations. But if they're not controlling our borders, they're not actually fulfilling Brexit, are they? Good, and this is why. And that's, that's, you know, I know there's a lot of technical stuff here that I don't understand. But, but really, controlling the borders is what it's yeah. about. And if they if they adopt equal access, allow them to keep coming over the border, it's just the equivalent of keeping free movement going effectively. Equal access is just the equivalent of fisheries going to that. You have to be But it's getting all the different people. You guys, you might be sitting at home one night and you think, oh, that would be a good poster. Okay. If somebody down in here who's a mutual organizer for fishing, they phone them up and say, that's a good idea. They give us a shout, we go into the graphics guys who work with and are on board, and have done all the stuff for fishing. That's a poster buying because I'm on social media, EDU, UKIP, was all over the country, and it causes a stir. That, that's the thing people in the fishing are going to have to do. It's not going to be a case of, oh, well, we'll see what happens, sit back and let somebody else go on with it. Everybody's going to start jumping up to the ground. Debbie phones all the answers, we're going to have a public rally in Newland to get the town behind it, we'll need to go, hand out flash, say, right, everybody, let's go and stick up notices in the local supermarket, all those little things. Proper control of the borders. And proper control, but that's exactly, this isn't a border, a territory dispute, but the government, the whole impression we can get at the conference, doesn't really want to have a fight over it. They just see it as, well, it's a 10,000 fishermen, we're lost already, we're, we're not going to stick our finger across the eye over. I hope 17 half million people are being kicked in the face for oh, yeah. trying our fish yeah. industry. Yeah. Eric, gentlemen, 17 and a half million. You know, I will be good dead there if you keep up any longer. No, I think, I think you made a really nice um, case about the, the ecology of the fish, fish system. But I think um, just speaking to, I've got friends up in London and listening to them, they're very aware that the fishermen in the southwest were against. Uh, were, were very strongly for the thing. Um, and they blame their, their falling economic situation and their falling house prices uh, and their struggles on the fishermen. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of frustration that they feel about all of the confusion and the uncertainty that's been brought about by Brexit. And I think that your message also needs to address uh, that I, I don't know how you do that, but you, you need to get to those people and, and make them realise the opportunities that you have. I think, I think this, you see, this is what you're trying to say all the time. It's the positive message. It's what this is going to be. I mean, at the end of the day, it's what was that, like 66 million or 60 million to come back to Cornwall. I mean, that's in four species. The total rate of fish on the bar will, down here, be in 100 to 100. That's a huge boost. What Brexit is, in some ways, isn't it? That's a huge boost to Cornwall, but the yeah, but, uh, so GDP is over 3,000 3, billion, so you know, it's still a small percentage. It's still a small pocket. It's all these bits of Brexit. I don't know. All the small Brexit is something, is it?